That whole reporting thing. Get to start again. Um, okay, hi, I'm Nathan Graham. Uh, thanks for much being here today. Uh, anyway, so uh, I've been with Keller Williams for 13 years, so a little bit about myself. Um, I obviously have a passion for teaching, and this is what I love to do, and eventually this is what I want to be doing for my whole life. Um, but I've been selling real estate for about 13 years now, and I always like to tell a little bit of my story. So I've been with Keller Williams for 12 years, one year with, uh, I don't know if I'm to say, one year with Remax, but we won't even go there. Um, so one of the things, uh, when I first got into real estate, my mindset, my attitude, and everything was a very different person than what you see before you today. And the reason why I like to talk about this person is because he did not have the confidence to do anything like this. So when I first got into real estate, I had this notion that I felt like I knew everything. And, and I, no joke, um, I was the kind of person who would probably take someone who's been in the industry for 15, 20 years and tell them how to do a script um, in my very first year. So as you can imagine, like most first years, um, my wife and I, we lived up in Collingwood. First year real estate, I got my license, she did not. We took out an $18,000 line of credit. We moved with the Ontario and we started real estate because that's a really smart thing to do with no money. Um, and the first year was horrible. I went nine months on selling one deal and that came from a connection up in Barrie. Now who here has been in the industry pre-2016? Okay, so we have people here who remember that in 2010, um, the Keller Williams luxury division started at $500,000 average sale price, right? So when you only get one deal and it was a $230,000 house, that was really big at the time by comparison. Um, so nine months, one deal, about to go bankrupt. Thankfully, we had family live here, um, which is very awesome when you're married about four years, moving back in with your parents. It feels great. Um, I went and got a job or an interview at Future Shop because I had to do something to make money. I'm a very big believer in providing for a family. No matter what, you have to do something to make money. And uh, my got my second interview. My mentor finally looked at me and said, uh, well, why don't you just do what you should be doing? Why don't you do the follow-up? Right? So I did open houses every weekend. So I took my open house leads from like three weeks before that. I started following up. I got my very first like self-generated listing appointment, my very first buyer, and I made more money between the two interviews in Future Shop in that week than I would have at Future Shop in a full year. And that's when I never decided to turn back. But again, remember, I knew everything. So in year two, I did what every smart realtor should do. Can you guess what that is? None of the things that made you money. Started a team, even worse. Because <laughs> I don't want to work. That's no fun, um, and it was very unfortunate. So I went through this really hard learning experience of starting a team. Um, and I've been very blessed in my life, to be honest. I had some great mentors who were willing to be very honest with me and help guide me through it. Because after that failed horribly, and unfortunately a few people probably got a little bit of hurt through the process and it did not benefit their careers. Um, it really was a big piece of humble pie. I joined a couple of teams which led me to 2015. And then come 2016, I went back out on my own that's when I started that house guy, which is that house group, and I never really looked back. And my intent was never to start a team. Um, so one thing uh, I found really quickly is when life has a way of, of throwing the things in that you need, um, you don't necessarily have to go create it sometimes. So I had no intent on starting a team, and I just got so busy that I needed a team, right? And so it kind of provided. Any Harry Potter fans in here? It was like the room of requirement. Like all of a sudden, the room just brings you whatever you require. Maybe that's what it's all about. I don't know. Anyways, um, since then, by the way, um, I don't really talk like talk about accolades, but we'll produce. We're not we're not mass mass. We're like I say we. I have my partner. She's kind of semi part time. This was mainly myself, but we'll produce about four hundred thousand a year as a team. Um, almost made that five hundred thousand dollar mark last year before this one. Um, so we're not. I don't know. I guess we're big status, but not mega mega multi million dollar producers. Uh, we just work really hard, uh, my partner and I. Um, we have an admin that helps take care of us. We will eventually look at expansion and all the rest, but not really until it's required. So I like to tell that story. So as we go in through today, um, any training I do is almost always an open book. So you can ask me questions about anything. We will get through the material, um, but if there's any questions that kind of pop up, if you want to know how to utilize this system to recruit, we can talk about that, how we can utilize it for teams, all the rest. Um, I just have a little bit of that experience with that 13 years. Sound good? Cool. Okay, so let's dive into it. Um, we are going to go really quickly into the paid and organic, um, or sorry, to the paid ads, but I always want to do a separation. First of all, paid ads are always done through business accounts. Okay, so uh, one of the big questions that kind of come up to play, and this answer, by the way, will change year by year after the many years of social media, um, it always changes is how much do you post personal and how much do you post 
business, right? And this is what I say, on your personal page, I post as much personal as possible. And on my business page, I post almost exclusively business. With the exception of it's tied into my Instagram, so every once in a while I'll get my Instagram posts. Um, so this is a course, for example, we're teaching that's business. Um, I smoke meat at home, that's why you'll see smoke meat pictures. And then you'll just see a lot of different real estate podcasts and everything else that I do. Okay. Now, fun story, I happen to think, in my head anyways, that I have a very marketable, very social media friendly brand. Um, and I've had this for, as I said, since 2016. And I've had followers since 2016. And in 2021, I went out and I bought a smoker. I've never smoked meat, I don't cook, and I'm like, dang, that looks cool. I think I saw America's Smoke Show on Netflix, and I'm immature, so I bought one. Um, and I was like, well, I can't just do this for myself. I need people to like what I do, because um, I'm a high ID, that high I kicked in, so I started posting things about me. Since 2000, and this is a big lesson Facebook, since 2016, nobody, almost nobody, will ever just organically reach out to me on Facebook about real estate. I now have more people ask me how to smoke a brisket from my business page than I ever have about that real estate side. So if there's one thing I really learned is my business page has now basically just turned into an ad creator. That's it. Nobody actually really wants to see my business um, at all on Facebook. What they want to see is all this extra fun stuff, and that's why you'll see a lot of personal go on there now as well. Okay? All right. So the fundamentals of creating an ad. Um, this could actually go really quickly. So I have actually have all the tabs up. So I just want to create ad on the page. These are my different options of what I can do. I almost exclusively go create new. One last part I'm quickly going to say is Facebook does change this on me on a monthly basis. So there will probably be something that throws me off. Um, and this is where I get to actually create the ad. Okay, so I have my ad account name, I get to do my write-up, and I get to select my multimedia. What I've done in pre-advance is here is an ad, for example, that I created on one of our listings. Uh, and it's not going to give me a good preview. Okay, so this preview here, I'm sorry, I thought this would be a much nicer preview. Okay, I'll see my so Nathan, you're doing yeah. these in Facebook and not in command. Yes. Okay. So really quickly with that, the reason why I do these in Facebook and not in command is I've done the same test measures that you were talking about. I actually do not get the same results through command that I do through Facebook. I'm at 10 to 15% through command of interactions versus Facebook, Facebook. How many are actual clickable leads though? At one point, I was getting 60 to 70 per ad. I'm down to about 5 to 10. Okay. So what's that on a per click basis? Do you know what the cost per click is? Uh, I don't know where I can tell you. Sorry, I just want to go back there so let me show you what this ads look like. <laughs> We'll go through the cost per click as well, because the cost per click is really in the end what's going to be the biggest difference. Anybody with a large enough budget can create a worse ad and still get clicks out of it. This is better how much we maximize it. So to kind of back up, my cost per click through Facebook was on average running me, or sorry, cost per lead was averaging me roughly five to eight dollars, give or take. And through this system was averaging anywhere from 83 uh, cents to two dollars and fifty cents give or take, depending on the ad. Um, okay, so the ad setup to me is very important. The first thing I like to do is always just listed, coming soon, whatever case may be, and I throw on a price and I throw on the address. Now, back five years ago, I never used to throw any of that on because it was a way to get them to click, and I found that people just got super annoyed and I got sick and tired of asking super annoying questions. So people were always like, instead of asking me about the property, they'd be saying things like, why don't you share the address? Why don't you share the price, blah, blah, blah. Just for fun, since I've put in the address and the price, do you know what my two most common questions are? 
Where is your address? What's the price? The, where is this located and how much is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, people don't read. Uh, then I'm going to give just generic idea, um, emojis along with things about the house. So this was a two plus two bedroom, one plus one kitchen, one plus one bathroom, separate entrance, laundry upstairs and down. The emojis are just going to grab attention. That's all they do as you're scrolling. And it's very quickly in a list base. And again, people just like to have quick, easy information as it goes down. And then only four to five features. You don't want 60 features on there and you don't want two. About four to five features is what I have found has worked the best for both Instagram, Facebook, and all the rest. And then I'm going to just talk a little bit about the property. Again, I don't want to deep dive into the property. Welcome investors and first time home buyers. This raised bungalow is full of potential, has a separate in-law suite with two bedrooms, laundry, and kitchen. Right? So again, it's just a very quick write-up to grab attention. One of the mistakes I have made and I still see some people make is they go into way too much detail here because they feel the need to explain everything about the property. Um, we know what the vast majority of buyers are looking for, right? So like if your house has an amazing kitchen and a, an amazing backyard and a fantastic master bedroom, which one do you think 99% of people or 90% of people want to actually see? Kitchen. Kitchen. What do you think number two is? Yard. Yard. So in that case, I might even do a test and measure on it, but I would definitely just be highlighting the kitchen more than anything in this ad. Okay, not going into too much detail. So Nathan, just before you, you mm -hmm. leave that, so 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 you have so part of what what we had learned um, before was you either you have three different types of social media ads. One to actually sell the listing, so you can find mm -hmm. somebody that's looking for something like that, and one to target buyers and one to target sellers. Okay. So are we? Is that something you're going to cover? In the test and measure that I've done, and I have wasted way too much money on Facebook, I have never once seen good results after targeting listing or buyers and targeting sellers. And I've went across the gamut. I've thought about things we've used, Agent Locator, we've even paid them to use it. I've used different companies. I've created my own ads. The cost on return just doesn't make sense to me. For me to create it myself is a similar cost for me to go pay a company to do it, right? Having said, and I mean, to kind of back up, those leads will roughly cost me anywhere from eight to $15 per lead minimum, right? So that's a huge return. These leads, this will give me, I'll show the numbers what comes out of here. This is why I've now just funneled my entire budget into advertising listings and that's it, right? Now, I think, and this is theory, there's a few reasons for that. One. People don't scroll through Facebook looking for a realtor, right? They actually don't even think, and so one of the ones, um, does anybody here use the Agent Locator website? I did in the past. It's, okay. They, they had this really cool nosy neighbor thing that gave you sold data. Like I thought to myself, everybody asked me for sold data, so I, I should just give away my sold data, right? Um, so I put that on there. I got almost next to no clicks off the same budget. Maybe I might get one lead off of it, right? Um, and I thought it would work out well. I don't think people are going through Facebook to start looking at things. What happens here, though, is people just start seeing the ad and they're like, oh, that house looks interesting, and they click on it. And that's what you're getting. You're just getting a whole bunch of random people click on the ads, and it's a straight up numbers game. And I'll explain how we break down those numbers. Okay, and the last part to that, sorry, was there, did that help answer that a bit? Um, and I want to back up to, that's my experience. Someone else may come in here and show you some great ads to run on how to get sellers. Uh, I just haven't seen any of them work in practice, um, but they've definitely sold me on a lot of programs for it. Um, hashtags, does everybody, un everybody understand hashtags, how they work? Does anybody not understand? I don't. Okay, <laughs> so very quick rundown on hashtags of why we do this. It's hashtags are uh, the best way to organize the internet. So for example, if I wanted to see some of a particular topic like houses, and I put a hashtag house, anybody who search houses, hashtag houses, will see my ad, along with any other hashtags, right? Um, so hashtags are connecting you to the audience that might be searching for what you want to show, okay? Now, there's a lot of things that we end up seeing, um, like I use uh, that house guy just because I want that hashtag to eventually one day trend, who knows? Investment, because people will search for investments. Real estate, realtor, KW, Keller Williams, first time home buyers. I'll always hashtag the area because there's a lot of people who use social media for local news. And then I do like things like hashtag family. If it's actually a beautiful garden or a beautiful kitchen, I might do hashtag reno design, hashtag garden, 
because I'm just trying to attract a whole different crowd of people. Remember? It's just raw number after number after number. Do you max out a certain number of hashtags? Usually it's about 8 to 10. Um, the vast majority of places only recommend 8 to 10. If you start getting too many, you start diluting um, mm -hmm. what the hashtag looks like. So that kind of actually goes back to another thing. Um, in social media, you have the ability to literally access millions, and I definitely do not recommend doing that. Um, you want to keep it as narrowed down to a degree as you can, right? Um, and I'm going to show ad placement, I'll show that. Okay, then as far as the photo goes, I just picked the most unique photo. If you can't tell, we do something a little different during Halloween. We create Halloween signs. Um, that's what we like to do to draw attention. Again, the photo, you just want the best front photo that you can find, right? Whatever attracts the best amount of attention. Only use one front photo though, because this is now what's going to get them. If you start giving away too many interior photos at this point, then there's no reason for them to even click on it to talk to you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. And I've also went through, I want to back up on this text test and measure because I don't know if there's pushback these days. Does everybody have sign-ins on their websites? to access information? Okay, this is like this debate back and forth, right? Um, and people will often say not great nice things about me on Facebook because I forced them to sign in. I went three years paying for Facebook advertisements, pushing out the fact that I make nobody sign in on my website. And my ads would read stuff like, uh, choose the realtor you want, don't be forced to sign in, call me when you're ready. Three years. Do you know how many people called me, you know how many uh, leads I got off that? None, not a single one. And I spent a ton of money on that budget. So always have some form of capture, and we're gonna show how Facebook also loves that form of capture, okay? Okay, so we're going back to the example um, of creating the ad, <coughs> excuse me. My automatic placement, I almost always let Facebook automatically place it. What, what is that? That's just kind of where they're going to place the ad, like between Instagram, Facebook, any other third-party websites that might come up. Um, have you ever seen like an ad for Facebook and it sometimes shows ads on there? Um, that's a way of tracking in between them. I'll just let Facebook figure out where they want to put it, uh, essentially is what I'm saying. Some people like to have their ad only on Facebook, and you can do that. I just think you're losing out overall if you put it only on Facebook. Um, the other thing, quickly with that, we'll get into this here. You know what, I should actually give it to it, so I won't give it to the ad. Okay, we talked about how to rate the ad, and then we talked about the image. I have done, it's up to you guys how much of tests and measure you guys want to do on this. I have tried multiple, multiple different images of what to make this front look like. I have tried tests and measures. In the end, what has always worked the best was the best front photo I could find. That's it. Feel free though if you want to do your own tests and measures to figure out what that looks like. Um, branded or unbranded, it doesn't matter. Here's one quick thing though. Do you see how this has writing on the photo? Um, it's funny, they don't show it on Facebook anymore. There's actually a grid. If I were to divide this up into a um, nine spot grid, this writing has to be only within three of the spots. And even if like one letter goes into the fourth spot, then Facebook is not gonna show my ad and won't like it. Right? That's why I'm using an older photo for this particular one that we used to run all the test measures on. We don't even do writing on the ad anymore because of that reason. They just okay. don't tell you that. They used they to. They reject the ad. Well, they don't always they reject don't the why. ad. They just don't always tell you. They used to tell you, like, oh, you need to fit it into here. Um, sometimes they approve the ad, they take your money, and then you're like, well, how come I got absolutely nothing? And that's the reason why. Another thing that I, uh, because this is also a little bit newer, Facebook, um, thanks to TikTok, which, yeah, we won't go there. Um, if you have TikTok, by the way, China knows everything about you, like scary amounts. So be very careful, read your terms of service on that one. But because of TikTok, they also learned that the video world is really taking over as well. Um, so I have not done this test and measure yet. This test and measure will be coming, or this is gonna be at least a little five second video pretty soon, okay? now. This isn't a video course, but just very quickly, when you use video on social media, depending on how long somebody watches your video is depending on how many people it's going to show it to. Okay, everybody's following my video with that? This is very important. If your video runs 
one minute, right? And somebody only watches 10 seconds of your video. Why did I do this? This is like really bad at math. What percent is that? That's like 16%. Well, no, 16%. Yeah. I know. I should have actually like like six or something like that. Um, so that's that's like what 16%. Okay. And what they're going to say is because they only watch 16% of your video, clearly your video is not interested, so we're not going to show as many people. Mm. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I run a 12-second ad and somebody watches 10 seconds of it, and I did even worse with the math, let's call that roughly 95%, then the algorithm's going to say, oh, they watch 95% of your video, so it must clearly be a good one. Mm -hmm. Who here is actually on TikTok? You want to try something fun? Do a five second video and see how many hits you get. Like, I didn't even know this was a thing. I did a five second video and all of a sudden, I got like 2,000 views very quickly, okay? Now, the other thing it is also going to do is going to go through a round, round of viewing, right? So imagine you have like round one. And let's say, you get 2,000 views. I'm just going to say it as an example. Now, you're going to go through round two. Um, first of all, if you only get like six views, you don't make it to round two. Okay? But if you get like a whole bunch of views, then you make it to round two. And if you get a whole bunch of views, you make it to round three. And then that's why you'll see they often compound very quickly. Sometimes when you get 2,000 views, and then all of a sudden you end with 2,050. And that means round two wasn't as interesting. So really quick, engaging videos work really well with that. Um, and I, I haven't tested measured in the ads, but I will be very soon because I think it's going to be booming big. So I've done one video on TikTok, and it was a minute and 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it had, it's got, so it's 1,500 views in about a week. Is that, like, what is the... So you probably got most of those. Like, it doesn't always register, but you probably got most of those in, like, the first day or two. I was thinking because like I'm like does it count people that watch it for half a second if because it's yeah. they're scrolling right so is that what counts if they stop like like if they, it, and I don't know the exact algorithm but like they, it can tell if it's just scrolling through if they actually stop and watch a portion of it that's what it counts okay. as a view it doesn't necessarily mean they watch the whole thing though okay right so yeah I just I just know TikTok algorithm is mental yeah it, it's ridiculous abusive <laughs> yeah and also by the way it literally like. In the, the reason why I said tell you to just very quickly tell you to read your terms and conditions is because uh, TikTok actually gives permission not only to access all your facial all your facial recognition data off your phone to permanently know exactly where you go, it actually also be, you're also giving it permission to access all your information with any other app that you use, any website you move in you use as well, as well as if you use log into that TikTok onto your computer it will have access to your entire computer stuff and everything. So if you do online banking, do not use TikTok on that device. I don't know what the Chinese government's gonna do, but I don't know, just food for thought about TikTok. That's okay, now that is the Chinese government. What's that? They don't know what they're doing either. Well, yeah, well, that's, uh, we'll go into a different debate on that. They're just investing in weather balloons that are weather yeah. balloons. Um, anyways, okay, so we are gonna be testing measuring video. That's a good idea for video, again, Video is going to be, uh, you want it very quick, you want it entertaining. If you are going to be doing longer videos, and please don't follow my social media for this because I actually do longer videos where I'm just talking. It's not the best idea. If you are going to do a longer video though, three second gaps, if you switch scenes every three seconds, that is going to keep optimal amount of tension. I know, it's why my kid's getting ADD and I'm sick and tired of watching Baby Bum. Literally, it's just every three seconds, whole new scene, whole new scene. If you notice a lot of the great videos on TikTok, uh, that are not revolved around talking or a topic, they're switching scenes every about three seconds, okay? All right, so going back to our ad, this is one very, very, very important part. Okay, so we have the description, which is above the ad. Now we're dealing with all this that's underneath the ad. What I will always write here, it never changes, is picks, price, info, Liney thing, liney thing, bracket. Let it populate here. And it did not populate there. 
just a line thing, line thing. <laughs> just something to make an arrow that's it. Like all I'm trying to do is make an arrow. Um, and I'm also going to change this to learn more. The button label will all, yeah, wait, hold on. Always learn more. How come it's not giving me the thing? Like you literally type that out or you put the picture, the price, like it's. Yeah, there we go. I put picks, price, info, liney, liney, liney thing, because then it points to learn more. Mm -hmm. okay. That's your description? That's the, the headline? at the bottom. So I have my nice description at the top about the property, and then the headline at the bottom is picks, price, info, line here to learn more, basically tell them to click there to learn more. Again, it's up to you guys if you want to test and measure this. I have literally had people yell at me for not getting the results, and it's because they've changed that. That is just one of those things, because you're literally telling people to click there. Have you experimented with how many liney things, liney things? Like, how long is the arrow? Can you make it longer? Did I? I did it once. Um, yeah. I can't remember why it resulted in two or three. Eventually, you can. If you go into Instagram, I believe it'll go. Um, it'll actually cut it off, uh -huh. and it'll go into two lines. Right. That's why I like just two and an arrow, because no matter what platform it's on, it's always on one. Gotcha. Oh, uh, I lied. I lied. Remember I said automatic? That would, they changed that on me. That wasn't automatic placement. That's why it wasn't showing for me. Where it says automatic, I don't want automatic results. I want to get more leads. That, that's very, very important. You'll see why. So as you can see now, it's going to say get more leads. Now, Facebook is going to yell at me. <clears throat> it's not going to force me to change this, learn more, but it's going to send me things saying like, if you change that button to let people know they're filling out a form, you'll get better results. Yeah, no, it's crap. I won't, and I don't. I want to, it sounds bad to say it, but I'll just say it in the bad way. I want to trick people to give me their information. I don't want them to know that they're going to fill out a form until they already click a button and fill out a form, right? The goal here is just raw numbers. It does. That's why I want raw numbers. Okay. And then on the form, I'm going to create the form. I'm going to name it something fun. And I just want a name, phone number, and email. That's it. Okay. So this is what it looks like. Now, because Facebook knows your entire life and absolutely everything about you, this autofills for everybody. So if you are actually click on one of my ads, you don't have to fill in your name, you don't have to fill in your email, you don't have to fill in your phone number, it autofills. So the client on the other side just has to autofill and hit next. Click OK. That's why it's so easy. Resist the temptation to ask for more information. I used to ask questions, are you pre-approved? Like I used to try to use this as a tool to weed people out. Don't. Simpler the better. Everything is completely simple. All they fill in is their name, phone number, and email. Yep, name, number, and email. Mm -hmm. That's it. And that's what I get. That's what they're going to send over to me, and I'm going to show you how to access those in a minute as well. Any questions about that aspect of it? For the purpose of organization, in theory, you can just have one form that you keep reusing. I'm going to show you why that's not a great idea. Always, for every single listing, do a new form. Okay, and I'll, uh, I'll show you why in the end though, it just has to do with when it emails with the form, there's very easy ways to know which form or which property they're looking at without actually having to dive into the email itself. Do you use Zapier to extract the content? I do, and that's exactly what we're going to be doing after this one. Yeah, no, we zap it over because Facebook's really bad at letting you, actually never even let, used to let you know at all that you had to leave it. Um, you had to go search it yourself. Okay, why are ads being um, declined? One of the biggest reasons why is because we often don't put in the special category of um, credit, employment, or housing. Okay, so you always have to say it is special, and you have to select housing. Now, it's been a while since I have done this. Um, they will sometimes, they used to, I don't know if they do anymore, so it's been a long time. 
They will often make you go through a process to somehow prove you're a realtor of some sort and tag it to your page, and you only have to really do it once, right? So the first time you do this, you may have see all these extra pop-ups, you're not doing it wrong, you just have to go through it the one time, and then they know that this ad is under special housing. And the reason why they do that is because um, we're super strict, apparently, on discriminatory laws, right? Now, uh, back in the day, um, I don't know why, I just talked to women a lot easier than I talked to men. Um, I found that women were the primary decision makers in most housing, and so I never ever once advertised to men at all. I never used to. Um, I found that if you were under the age of 18 or 25, you probably weren't buying a house. And um, I mean this in all due respect, but I don't work well with elderly people. It's just not my skill set. So a lot of times, I never used to advertise to anybody over the age of 50, right? So it was like 25 to 50, and that was it. That is now considered discriminatory, and now I have to advertise to everybody. So um, when you create your audience, you cannot get too strict about your audience, okay? That's another place where people start to get rejected. Now it'll be interesting where you guys are from. Now, what you can create, let's go here. Okay, it's gonna auto put in an area for you. Um, I used to work out of the New Market Aurora location. I don't know why it still auto does it, it drives me bonkers. Um, but it will auto put in an area for you and you wanna design the area of uh, where you're targeting your ad. Years ago, I was in a mastermind with um, Sean Bravanche and a few other people. And we were talking about how do, can we refer back and forth. And I don't know if you know, Sean Bravanche at the time worked down at the beaches. So he was like that core downtown area of Toronto, which I do not know at all. And there was a very interesting thing. We had a person over here from Hamilton. We had someone from Barrie. I was from Durham. Kind of all surrounding Toronto. And when it came to referrals, it was weird. I never, ever have anybody asking to move into Toronto. Like, very, very rarely. So unfortunately, everybody in this room, I will not have referrals for you because apparently people just want to get out. And that's exactly what we saw happening. It's everybody would expand out. And the vast majority of people, like, the second someone says Pickering, they wouldn't go north or west or east west got my directions, all that stuff, they would only really go east. And the second they said Hamilton, like we rarely had people looking at both sides. You guys are kind of in this weird central area, so you might actually have a bigger surrounding area of what you might look like. The point that I want to try to get to, though, is don't advertise your ad out here, or out here, or out here. If you're located here, advertise your ad there. Because that's where people are moving from to get to you. Okay, and then just pick an area, approximately 25 miles, get a few referral partners. Every once in a while you get an outlying person who wants to move a dramatic distance away. Um, but again, I have never, ever had somebody move back into Toronto. Okay, so, yeah. That's, as you expand your database based on the criteria of people that are searching the hashtags that you're looking for, aren't you looking if like, I grew up in Hamilton Road. I have no problem with this. So if I drop a pin in Hamilton Road and it overlaps in Mississauga with the Toronto listing, I'm going to get people on the outside. Sorry, let me back up. So when I advertise mine, you're more central here, so it's a little hard. When I advertise mine, though, so like if this is Oshawa, I might go out to Bowmanville, which is like right beside us, but I'm advertising this way. I'm not advertising Kingston. I'm not advertising Brighton. You might get some overlap, and the overlap is just overlap. And odds are someone's going to do this, and then they're going to be like, well, I just got two leads from the opposite way of what I just said. And it can happen. And like, I'm not saying it's impossible. It's just, to me, it's all about maximizing where my budget is, right? And if I know the vast majority of people are moving from here out, I want to advertise from here in. I might get the occasional person. If I advertise up in Peterborough, I might get the occasional person who's like, well, I just took a job at uh, Darlington and Whitby and I want to move there. But that's just a big budget to try to get that one needle in a haystack. Does that make sense? It does, but the budget's a budget. Aren't you trying to get as, as broad a scope as possible 
for the limited number of people that are looking for... No, nope, I'm not. So when you go too broad, it's just going to waste my time. So like if there was... Um, because, okay. sorry, yeah, no, it's okay. not, in, no, it's okay. not in a derogatory way, because you don't move out of Oshawa, Durham, so it's a waste of time to get Toronto leads? No, because um, for the little amount of leads I would get, that's going to juice up my price per click. I need more people from Toronto clicking on my ad, which it doesn't matter who fills up forms. Everybody who clicks on my ad is going to cost me money, okay. right? And that means more people are going to click on my ad and less people are actually going to give me their information and less people are going to convert out of those people who do give me the information. So it's costing me more money, right? If I have a choice, and I guess one other thing to kind of back up something we haven't talked about, what we will get into this more, you can only really deal with about, if you're properly working internet leads, you can only deal with about 150. Once you get over 150, it is way too much work if you are properly following up with them all. So that's also now limiting my overall time for how I can deal with these people. So I want to deal with the maximized rate of what that looks like. That piece of puzzle probably would have helped before, <laughs> which we will get into as well. Um, so Nathan, yeah. are, you, are you bumping up the quality of the leads this way because they're specifically looking for the type of house that you've just advertised? I'm trying to think of, I don't know if I'd say I'm bumping up the quality of leads. I think the other thing, because a lot of the times people are like, wow, that house, like, um, what, what does a 2,400 square foot home sell for in your area? Well, there's too many areas for well, us to be three million. Three million? Yeah, ours are like 1.2, right? And 1.3 maybe. So if I, have, if I have this ad that shows in Toronto, like, buy this house for 1.3, people are like, it's crazy, where is that, right? And it might just be enough to help figure that out. I don't know if it's really bumping up the quality. I just... I know more people are likely to click going this way than the other way, so it just reduces my cost per click. The quality of internet leads, I, I kind of back up, the, the quality of internet leads sucks. Um, like I'm going to show you our spreadsheet of what this looks like. They suck. Um, and there's no, I've, I've not found a way around that yet, kind of, well, yes and no. Um, I haven't found a major way around that, of just that raw number. So it doesn't really bump up the quality, it just keeps my cost per click down. Again, it's just raw numbers. I know, again, like I don't want to advertise to Peterborough because I know I'm probably going to spend the same budget, get half the amount of leads, and then I have to somehow convince them to move to Oshawa, which it's hard to convince people in Oshawa to move to Oshawa, let alone someone from like a nice little outskirt. You know what I mean? So, Okay, so pick the areas. You can pick more than one area. That doesn't matter. So like, for example, when I have a listing in Peterborough, I will take a Peterborough area, I'll also take Lindsay, I'll also take Clarington, I'll take an Oshawa, and I'll kind of keep moving it back. Okay? This is just with your generic house listing. If you are doing something like a cottage, well again, cottage I wouldn't go out, but like if I was doing a cottage, I'd probably focus on more dense areas for my advertisement as well. Um, because someone who say lives in, I live in Seagrave. Um, if you guys ever drive through it, prepare yourself. If you sneeze and blink, you'll miss it completely. There might be 20 of us. We used to have a zoo, and I don't even think we have a corner store anymore. That's how big Seagrave is. But we all have one acre lots, and there's trees around us all, and it's great. I'm probably never gonna buy a cottage. I don't have to, right? So a dense population area though, they want to, they start dying to get out of the city. So I'd probably be more specific if you have a custom property along those lines where I advertise to. Um, but as far as your average housing, I just take wherever it is and go in towards Toronto. Okay? All right. My brain is melting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, this is something else that's kind of brand new. I. I'll be honest with you, I don't really click a lot of these because these are now special interest groups and um, I don't really want a special interest group. And I'll explain why in a moment. Um, just for the sake of showing this as an ad. Okay. So, I can choose a start date and an end date on my ads. We've been spoiled over the last few years. Normally I only have to run my ads for seven days, which means I get to put a much larger budget into it. 
That house I use as an example with our Halloween sign, we just sold that at the end of January. That was a four month listing. Um, so I learned something new. We cannot continually run an ad for four months. People just stop seeing it, right? And it looks boring. Um, so what I actually started doing was running them one week on, one week off, or two weeks on, one week off sort of thing, and taking breaks in the ad, because then I found it started juicing it up. So I do control what those end dates look like. And my average budget, I don't know, would be roughly around five to 10 bucks a day, depending on what I want to spend. When you're rolling this up to clients, do you give them an idea of what you're, like in your listing presentation, mm -hmm. do you give them an idea of what your marketing expenses for social media are? Yes, um, I will be honest though, I usually show my yearly total. Um, versus just what I spend on a per house because I spend roughly 30 to 40 grand a year on social media. Um, so I'll show that budget, mm -hmm. um, what the whole total thing was. I don't go into these details. It because it doesn't look like a lot. It, it, it's number one, it doesn't look like a lot. Number two, clients don't understand. Like, mm -hmm. if I were to tell them, like, hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, by the way, we advertise your property for one week and then we take it off the internet for another week. They'd be like, what, why? Just leave it on. They don't understand the way that it revigorates the market, so I don't get into those details. I just show them that we do it and what it looks like when we do it. I also tell them, this is something else very, very important, tell them to ignore the comments, especially if it's not in a great area. Um, I once had a divorce case, which was referred to me from a lawyer with the one party who was very much an alcoholic who liked to go on social media and talk crap back. And somebody was tearing apart, and she took a lot of pride in her house, so someone was actually tearing apart something on the outside in the ad. And in front of everybody, she said something along the lines of, well, if your low-life husband cheats on you and forces you into a divorce, let's see what the outside of your house looks like. Bye-bye, <laughs> negotiations. Any leverage we have is now gone. Right? So um, if it starts <coughs> to get really bad, I will just shut off comments altogether. Now... This is a personal philosophy. Every negative to me is an opportunity to show who I am, right? So, reason why I don't, unless it gets bad, the reason why I leave comments on, even though like, uh, again, I don't know if you guys know much about Oshawa, there's some really bad areas in Oshawa where somewhat lovely ladies with almost all their teeth hang out in front of your apartment building and for a few dollars, they'll come party with you anytime you want, apparently. That's how bad Oshawa is. What's the address? Um, 1010 Glen Street. Um, had a few listings there. Anyways. Um, Most of South Oshawa. <laughs> yeah, South Oshawa. Yeah. Um, people will trash that whole area. It gives me an opportunity, though, to show as a realtor how I'm going to defend my clients and defend those areas. Right? So don't always turn them off. Don't definitely react emotionally. If you can't control your emotions, you want to tear into them, just shut comments off. Right? Don't, don't go there. I just like that opportunity. It's fun for me. Mm -hmm. Hide or delete? <coughs> Sorry? Hide or delete the comment? Hide. Hide. I almost never delete comments. Um, even at times, like there's times I don't get notified for comments, so there's times they're actually trashing me as a realtor. And to me that's even better because there's a better opportunity to come back and apologize and tell them how I'm going to fix it on a public forum. Like, I love it. So I almost, almost never delete comments. Um, the only time I'll start deleting them is when they start getting crazy personal or excessively bad. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how come it's not showing me here? Okay, so they must have changed the page on here, and I, I'll be honest with you, I won't be able to go find it right now. But one last thing before we move on. Uh, Pixel. Facebook Pixel. P-I-X-E-L. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to integrate this into command uh, websites. I know if you have a third party website, again, like Agent Locator or something like that, I honestly do not work for Agent Locator, that's just who I use, so that's what I know. Um, okay, so the way Pixel is a targeting thing, this is very, very important. Um, tag marketing is have you ever been to a website where you, like a news, like Globe and Mail, and you see an advertisement on the side? That's tag marketing. Have you ever noticed in a creepily fashion, sometimes that advertisement is something you were recently talking about or looking at? Mm -hmm. 
is because of the pixel. The pixel got, from, like that's what pixels do, is they tag you. Um, so I pay for tag marketing through Agent Locator. If you go to my Facebook page, you're gonna start seeing my face everywhere. It's great, uh, kinda. Um, I say kinda because sometimes you get these news articles, like my favorite one was something along the lines of why women who swear are not smart, and then it had this big, buy your house with Nathan, <laughs> right, right below it, I'm like, wow, that ad looks really bad. Um, so I created into a contest. If you can find my ad on the worst article, I'll do a prize. Um, and I got some great submissions on that. Anyways, turn on the pixel, because now two things are going to happen. One, anybody who visits you or your site, they're gonna start seeing your marketing going back and forth on their sites. Two, Facebook Pixel is also going to recognize if they go to another realtor site, that Pixel is going to be on their computer, right? That um, uh, in their cached history, and then it'll recognize it to your ad. It'll say, "Hey, this person is looking for houses. You have a housing ad," and it shows your ad to people who are actively looking. How do you turn it on? It's just a click button. It's literally just yeah. It's you'll see. It used to be here. That's the problem is I don't know where to find it right now because they changed it on me. It used to be on the ad. Um, Google it. Google how to turn on Facebook Pixel. But um, the answer is yes. Yeah, and then do you turn want that pixels? on. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then whatever third, if you have a third-party website, just see if they use tag marketing. That it's ingenious, and I definitely highly recommend. It is a boatload of fun to hold those contests with your database. So your database will often be kept. Uh, I'm checking on you, and you will start getting messages from your database being like, dude, are you stalking me? Right? Because they'll start seeing your ads everywhere. And then hold a contest, like get your lawyer to give you some Raptors tickets and be like, whoever can find my ad in the most embarrassing article, then I will give Raptors to, and we'll let the community vote on it. And people just get a howl out of it. So. How many, your personal and your professional or your business page, have, are they close to the same number of followers on each? Uh, no, I think I have like 3,000 friends, um, so they're not really friends, like 3,200. Yeah. And this one I think I have 1.6 thousand. Uh, so you run those, you run, 1600. you run those. Pixel only works on business, it doesn't work on personal. Right, but yeah. you run you run the, hey, find my ad in the worst possible spot through your professional page or your personal page? Both. I'll post it on my professional page and then I'll share it out to my friend page. My friend page will have a little mix of everything. I share everything on the real estate side, but it also gets a lot more personal side with it. Um, and again, definitely find a hobby with the friend page. It makes the world of a difference. Uh, side note back to that, um, I used to have this guy on my team who had uh, two young kids, by the way, and uh, we found an Instagram account that had that house baby, wasn't us. And they actually took photos of his kids and started putting them in places. So I would, uh, if you are going to go that route of posting family photos, just remember, keep an eye out there for places that it might be. Um, it used to work. I think you can still do this. <clears throat> Okay, do you see I right click the image and it says search image with Google? I really hope this doesn't blow up on my face. My face. Oh, okay, it's just doing it with my jacket right now. By the way, if you ever want to figure out what someone's wearing, that's how you can figure out how to buy it. Um, but there is a way you can actually search your image in Google. Um, I just have to mess around with it um, on how to do that, but there is actually a way to do that if you're ever curious on someone stealing your accounts. You can try and drop your image into the search bar and it'll pull up. We'll do it that way too. Perfect. I don't, you can tell I don't do it that often. I really don't care where people post me. Okay. So. The next part to this is now is in the organizational <laughs> side. Now I apologize. Uh, this is uh, okay. Remember I said internet leads suck. They really do. Um, on first of all, they take an average of four to six times before we even make a connection with them, right? The second thing is 
if you are using this for yourself, then obviously it's your own work. If you're using this for your team, which is a great option for your team, by the way, um, you they will get burnt out very, very quickly. And they'll often not do the four to five follow-ups, and that is what's going to make or break of it going up to a team. So, for the longest time, uh, up until very recently, just because of market shifts, I hired an ISA. I went to, uh, you guys know what Cyberbacker is? Yeah. For the Cyberbacker? So I have a Cyberbacker ISA, Marissa. Um, she automatically gets all these leads. We don't even see them as a team until they agree to talk to us, right? And this is how we tracked it. So as you can see, um, we have it from the first time we listed for a second price reduction, third price reduction. Um, we were averaging on, I think we were running $5 a day. One, two, three, four, five leads that day. One, two, three, four, five leads. One, Six, seven, eight leads. So we're averaging five to eight leads every single day on about a five to ten dollar a day budget. So we're averaging roughly a dollar to a dollar thirty a click, give or take. Um, all the blues are calls not completed. So she would put this into this system. Calls not completed being fake number? Yes. Or could not be completed, I should say. Okay. No answered voicemails, talk to lead not interested, all the yellows are interested, okay? So roughly, when the ad was fresh, and this was the first kind of kicker to it, when the ad was fresh, we were about one in every 10, give or take, was actually interested in talking to us, okay? So that was the longest stretch we went, but as you can see, that was what, from what? 27 to 48, so that was 11. You average it though between those two. You're about one in every 10, give or take, were actually interested in talking to us. The longer we ran the ad though, the less those numbers became. That's why we started taking breaks in it. So now we're on to number two, time ran it. Yeah, so like the second time we ran the ad, this was, uh, we did a price reduction, we didn't take a break. You can see it's a dramatic difference, no yellow until point to the bottom. Um, and you're hitting them every day? Yeah, every single day uh, for four to six days before they drop off. And then even after that, when my ISA was bored and she went through all the new ones, she'd go back to a seventh time and start calling again. With this... Like all calls, all emails, all texts, or is there a rotation of? Oh, call, email, text, each one, each day, until we get a hold of them. So first day, call, nothing, text, to let them know that we reached out, and then follow up with an email right afterwards. And the, um, I'll go into the script in a minute. So timing also made a big difference too. If we could catch them in the first five to ten minutes of filling out the ad, that had a much higher chance of getting them on the first try. Um, honestly, whether you're using an ISA or a buyer's agent to do this, they rarely ever catch them that quickly, so that's why we do it four to six times. How quickly did they get into command? They only get into command once we talk to them. Yeah, because this one here, I, I like clean and neat databases, and if you don't want to talk to me, I really don't care to talk to you. I'd rather have 500 great people than 10,000 horrible people. So the only time we start putting them into command is when we actually talk to them and we have engaged with them. Right? and then they go directly into command from there. Out of those, um, this time around, so I restarted this process, when was Mega Camp? October? Uh, August? August? So I restarted this process in August, um, going into September. I tried to exclusively hand all these out to buyer's agents, and I wasn't getting anything, like all these leads, I was like, this is insane. Um, I found out later they weren't following up with any of them. So come December, I recalled everybody on the list, uh, and it was roughly at about that three to four percent range that had already bought um, a property. Imagine I was extremely happy, right? So now I take care of them all myself. We have since January, we have people in car, we have people that are actively looking, uh, but it will bring down. You need about a hundred leads to close about three to four deals, give or take, if you're following up this much. 
how many of your ads are listings versus general inquiries for service? All of them are listings. There's no yeah. generic, hey, are you looking for a real Generic ads were just way too expensive. Way, way too expensive. Like, it, like again, these were like, for, okay, the generic ads are the exact same numbers game. You're going to be about a 3% conversion ratio. The difference is it's costing me $8 to talk to them, or $8 for a chance for them to say no versus $1.50. So you're running like 15 to 20 ads a year? Yeah, um, if even that, or depending on running some simultaneously. Like you can imagine, these fill up pretty quickly to get talking with. Um, and when we're just talking about 150 lead max, right? Um, for an individual agent, these are the 150, not the yeses. Everybody is about 150 you can be calling. I'll probably run one to two at a time um, at any given time, depending on the market, depending on where our workload is. Um, so right now we're just running one, for example, right? Um, but when we have no buyers in car or nothing, we'll run to all borrow someone else's listing from the office if I don't have one. That was my next question. Because yeah. you're not just running your listings. That was my question. Yeah, anybody's listing who will give me permission to advertise it. Um, a little cautionary tale on that though. First time home buyer and investment properties will generate the most amount of leads. Multi million dollar homes are fun to advertise, yet you just get a lot of people just looking and that's that, right? Because they want to see what a two, three, four million dollar home looks like. Right? They'll find something with an investment property. Fine, so like for you guys, honestly, I'd probably give someone a shout in Whitby and be like, hey, can I advertise your duplex for $800,000 here, right? You will get just crap tons of these. I love advertising duplexes for, I, okay, fun fact. Who here does investments? Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I've just found two for buyers. Go look at Brighton. If you don't want to show, I'll gladly pay you a referral fee. They have duplexes. I just got my client a duplex for Four hundred and two thousand dollars. That's generating roughly four thousand dollars a month in income. In There's Brighton? duplex is under five hundred thousand. It needs work. It's not going to be beautiful, but in Brighton and in Belleville, Lindsay right now has a triplex for under five. I just got my clients a detached home because they didn't get approved for the duplex. They wanted an investment, but they only wanted five percent down. We just paid three seventy seven for a detached home. Wow. So just letting you know that there's, as soon as you go outside, like, that's why I love, I advertise that property out this way, man, this is, this is gonna go through the roof, right? Right, and all those two hours to the city. Yeah, about that one, yeah. yeah. So usually you're looking for a commuter, like as long as they get to Oshawa, would be there about 45 minutes from Clarington. Yeah, about an hour and a half to here. So. A lot of people looking at Belleville for an investment right now. Yeah. I just talked to a girl at the point four out there. <laughs> Every, I just bought. I just talked to a girl last night at my at my other job. We just bought a one point four out in Belleville. Oh, it was a huge house. Oh, it was massive. It's a mansion. It's massive. Yeah. Okay. So, the script is very very simple on this one. Um, all my scripts always come from a giver's game mentality, right? So they kind of back up. You can use whatever scripts you want. I'm just sharing with you the ones that work well for me. If I'm to start off with the word I want or anything then it's not about the client. I always go back to the client. Hey, this is Nathan Graham calling from Keller Williams. You recently clicked an ad and I wanted to make sure that you found everything that you were looking for. And of course, yeah, no, sometimes they're complaining, oh, your link didn't take me anywhere. Or I had to fill in, this is my favorite one because I do make them do this. I had to fill in another form on your website. And I'm like, yeah, that's how I knew you were serious. Um, but I'll send in my website to fill out another form um, and all the rest. And I'll say, okay, great. Well, now that I've actually gotten a hold of you, I'll tell you what, I apologize for everything that you had to go through. Let me just simplify it for you. I'm gonna go to my website, create an account for you. I'm gonna email you over the listing. Okay, don't worry, it's not gonna bother you. I'm just gonna take it, email it over you. Does that sound good? And then you say something like, yeah, that sounds good, right? And I'll say, fantastic. Well, actually, while I'm emailing that one, I have about 10 others that are very, very similar to it. Do you want me to email you those as well? And they'll always say, yeah, of course, right? And through this, I'm just building rapport now that we have this up and going, great, so you're looking in this particular listings in Peterborough, that's where you're looking, let's review the criteria, right? And then one of my favorite scripts, which they almost never say no to, is I would say, hey, listen, um, obviously we're not working together, you don't know me, but I have to preview 10 homes a day anyways, or five homes a day anyways, and I'm gonna go out and preview homes up in Peterborough. Do you wanna just join me for these five? I'll just make them about you. And I'll just show you what it looks like to set up homes or to look at homes. Sound good? And they'll usually say yes or no to that. But either way, I'll usually build some sort of relationship by offering it out that way um, to go see homes. Any questions about that? Is this the last part, maybe? Okay, so we went through 
how to create the ad to get the leads, and then we kind of went through what it takes to follow up with the leads. Now we have this other weird problem, is how do you know a lead has come in? Because <laughs> believe it or not, Facebook does not make this simple. They never even used to notify you when somebody filled out a form, and now that they do notify you, it doesn't always come in on time, doesn't come in that quickly. So I use a program called Zapier. This is very, is that what it means? It zaps it from one person to another. This is a paid program. I want to say it's like 20 bucks a month or something like that, if even. 27. The 27? You pay for the year in advance. Yeah, that's what I do. I just pay for the year. So, okay, 300 bucks a year, call it. Um, and this is what it would look like. So this was one on Nash Road. Uh, let's see. Okay, so it's just a very quick two-part system. Um, you have to pay for the paid version to do Facebook ads, by the way. There's a lot of free things you can do with it, but you have to do it for that one. Um, it triggers. The second somebody fills out a form on my Facebook page, it'll be a new lead. Okay, so that's the event that, that's created. This is my ad account. So that's how it knows it's me. And then here's the trigger. So it's my page. Remember when I told you to name those forms after the property? Yeah. This is why. Because it's going to look for the name of that form, and whenever that particular form gets filled out, you now know about it. And again, it has all your information. So whenever this form comes in, it has your, this looks a lot more complicated than it is, it has your first name, last name, phone number, uh, and all the rest. That's the information that's grabbing it from there. Okay, so that's trigger number one. Trigger number two is now the email. So once that information comes out, I'm gonna send an outbound email. This is my admin account that we send them all to. Now, this was a little bit of a test and measure. When we were running multiple ads, the problem is we didn't know which house they were coming in on. And if the agent was on the road, this is before we had an ISA, when an agent was on the road, they wanted to know at a quick glance which one it is. So we started naming in the subject, New Lead Nash, or New Lead Cassandra, or New Lead Tudor, whatever the street was there. And then in the base of the email, so if I just click, all I did was click, these are all the options from Facebook and information it's giving me. So I put the full name, the email, and the phone number. So that way whoever was getting the lead or writing the lead to would have all the information at a touch. There would be no attachments. And in this particular case, at the time we had Regine who was following up on all the leads. Um, if I have an agent and it's their listing, they get all the leads to it, whatever case may be. And it's so as simple as that. If you're advertising another listing in your office and you're paying for the ad, no, if uh, if like Lisa, my buyer's agent, it's her listing. She gets the leads. She, I'll give her the leads over top unless she doesn't want to work them um, for whatever reason. So, and in that way, I get an email the second a lead comes in, and it's pretty dang quick when it comes in. The cool thing about Zapier, though, uh, so I I can ask a question. Yeah. Sure. Um, so you say you get a better return when you when you respond to those like as soon as possible, like when yes. they come in here soon. Because I remember when the QR codes first came out and we hung those little signs below your for sale sign and people would take a picture and then you get an email and the text saying like, someone's just asked about one two three Smith and you'd call them they would freak them and they go what was that what and they would like burn their phone um, before answering or like they they were they were totally shocked that someone had contacted them so quickly. Yeah, um, they still are. Okay. A lot of times I'll get a lead in, they'll be like, wow, I'm still on your website, right? And I'm like, yeah, that's how good we are. That's what we can do when we go to find you a house, right? Like, I will actually make jokes around it, but yeah, I know they're often pretty shocked. Um, and the comment, it sounds weird, but that, okay. Whoever here has been in a timeshare presentation? <laughs> I love it. You went in to buy something, right? Like, you never made an agreement before not to buy anything. Exactly. Everybody goes like, I used to sell timeshare, that's why I know. I was not good at it. Um, everybody makes an agreement before the timeshare presentation, I'm not going to buy timeshare. So because there's all this time though beforehand, it allows them to put themselves into an attitude and a pattern, right? So when they sit down, 
the people, they don't realize it, but they know how to respond negatively and how to do it. And as a salesman, all you're trying to do is break that pattern and try to get into them, same kind of with sales. When you respond to someone that quickly and they're still in front of the house or they're still in front of the computer, it doesn't give them time to get into a negative pattern to say no to you, right? It's throwing them so off guard that they're like, wait, what? And it's the perfect opportunity to have a real genuine conversation with them. So as an example, who here does open houses? I still, to this day, um, if I have a great lead, do you know when I send my first follow-up email? Five o'clock. The second they leave. I have it pre-done on my phone. I just put a dear so-and-so, paste it in, put in their email, say it was great to meet you. They often get the email by the time they're in their car driving out of that open house. That's when I send my first thank you email for coming in. Breaks the pattern. They're not expecting it, right? They're expecting the two other realtors, maybe two others that actually do it. Um, to send it at a later time, so. Okay. One last thing you can do with Zapier, which I think is absolutely brilliant. You can also not just send yourself an email, but you could have it so it sends you a text message. Um, so who, who here is an iPhone user? Okay, I love, I'm also an iPhone user. I love iPhone. I love iPhone for everything except for this. Um, I don't know if you know this, you don't get your emails right away. It's a push te or a fetch technology, not a push technology, right? Which often means sometimes you wait three to five minutes before getting your emails, which normally is not much, but in the internet lead game, that can be a lifetime, right? So this will also send me a text message the second that the lead comes in, and it's the exact same information. Just obviously make sure you keep it, I say obviously, but I didn't do it for the longest time. You have to keep it to all your 140 characters or less. Um, name, email, phone number, and then what I will actually do on this one is put the, um, I don't know why it's not on here, but I'll also put the property name. So it texts me what property you came in on. And that way I get the email right away. And you call them immediately. Immediately. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, as quickly as I can. Wait until you do it the first time. It'd be like. Especially, it worked a little bit better when we were doing agent locator leads in the sense that we'd have them right in front of the computer, but wait till you get them right in front of your computer and that surprise that they give you, that you followed up that quick. So. All right. Without Zapier, how do you, how do you find out you have a lead come in from Facebook? It'll give you a little notification. Mm -hmm. Then you'll have to go into your uh, business account and then go under their notifications to take a look at it. Yeah, because I have like this whole, you know, when I set this all up on Facebook, it hooked me up with this like business campaign manager, right? Mm -hmm. So like what I have, it doesn't look like what you have going on there. Um, it has like a campaign, ad sets, ads. It looks totally different. Uh, let's see if I can recreate it here for you. So, Thanks, yeah. Nathan. Thank You're welcome. So much. Yeah. Very well done. So I was going to ask if you had a couple minutes after so I didn't take up time asking about that. <laughs> I just want to see something real quick. Does it look like that? No. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll take a look at that afterwards then. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to take oh. a look at If you don't did mind, you, thank you. Did you, have a, did you go straight to uh, the SAP or did you try and follow up? It went some other way. Okay, so funny enough, we never actually tried Follow Up Boss for the longest time. I used Follow Up Boss for something else, and it also worked great with okay, the ads. Yeah. yeah, if you're already using Follow Up Boss, then definitely go ahead and use that. Zapier has a few other options, like um, I don't know if you guys know what Discord is, but I run a Discord channel, or even get a Discord channel for agents um, starting up. It'll actually auto do like, podcasts to it and stuff like that, so there's a lot of little extra things. But if you're doing it just straight for leads, yeah, it's Follow Up Boss is fantastic. So, yeah. And I think follow up bots too to kind of back up will also send an auto text to the client. You could even automate that right away. Anything I could automate up for. So, yeah. Alrighty. Thank you. So, oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> Gonna drop off. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much for <laughs> taking your Appreciate time it. out to make us all clear what we do. Of course. And if you guys like this, please, I enjoy teaching more. Um, yeah. So that, that's pretty much all of it in a nutshell. Um, as I said, it doesn't usually take two hours, but our in 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Any questions on this side? Um, do you think we can't uh, add as much better than the business day? Because people are free, they have more time to look at the Facebook. Sorry, do I find what? what? Uh, the ad on weekend, choose the weekend day for ad, not the ah, business yes and day. No. I find it, well, uh, 
I, I, I'm trying to remember the exact times. It'll actually will go into the analytics, but I believe it's between three and seven of almost every day is when you'll get the vast majority of ad leads come in. Um, I would check your analytics on that um, before I even make a decision there. So, yeah. Thank you. One last thing I always like to talk about, because this isn't uh, Google paid ads, but do you guys run Google paid ads as well or anything like that? No. Okay. True. Um, maybe. Google's like, usually need a big budget. I just wanted to share an idea with you guys that we're now test and measuring, so I, I don't know the results yet. Um, anybody, anybody buy a new computer recently? Okay. I don't know. With Windows? You buy Windows? Can we, yeah, you no, no, we don't. Okay. You're back. Okay, so when you buy Windows, what search engine does it come with? You guys know? Yeah, I don't remember. I thought it here somewhere. It's Bing. Horrible. Bing. Bing. It's Bing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, who here does not know how to change their search engine like really quickly? You, like you usually just go to like, you go to whatever it is and you Google. Oh, you just click yeah. Set like, that. Yeah, like yeah. But most people, a lot of people, believe it or not, do not know how to do this. Yeah. Right? They just think Bing is the way to go, no matter how much. There's also a new one called DuckDuckGo that we're going to be testing, and measuring some ads on. Um, fun fact, though. If I have a $500 budget on Google, I get so many ads, and if I have a $500 budget on Bing, I get a crap ton more leads off of it. Now, there's a lot less people that use Bing, but I don't care. If it fills up my budget, then I know there's enough people to use it for what my budget actually is. And because nobody, like, who here ever thought about advertising on Bing? Who here ever thought about advertising on Google? So look at my competition now all of a sudden, right? So I just want to give some food for thought. If you're looking for other forms of online lead generation, just think outside the box a little bit. Bing comes pre-installed on every single non-Apple computer that's out there. And the vast majority of people do not know how to change that. So if they're Googling or searching for a realtor, you know, might just have a good option there. First thing that comes up is Bing paid at $600 credit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that is so cheap, man. Well, Google does the same thing, and I got roped into that, and I posted an ad I didn't know it posted, and next thing I know, I was out 150 bucks. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, they did that too. Right? Right. Yeah. So anyways, just food for thought, um, going outside. And then another one that uh, I haven't looked into much, I'm just beginning to use it, um, is DuckDuckGo. Uh, that's going to be the new Google type, because honestly, the AI search engine scared the crap out of me. Um, so I'm trying to find ways to go around that. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. The AI search engines. Have you have you done uh, Chat GPT yeah. yet? Oh yeah, build my whole website. Yeah, so like I I like Chat GPT um very much in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Having said that, until you can tell anybody can show me how it won't be biased to its creators, I I don't trust it. So like if you Google about a certain individual, um, it'll be extremely biased. If you ever actually want to have a fun. Uh, I did this the other day and it blew up in my face because it used to do this. Google used to have this thing that if you Googled um, a certain type of things, like a family, um, it would only show fighting white families and then together everything else, right? Google like, controls how you view the perception of the world through their imagery and it's really scary when you start diving into it by searching certain things. So here, okay, perfect example. During the 2016 election, if you were to Google Donald Trump on Google, the top five ads would be like horrendous ads about Donald Trump. And if you were to Google Hillary Clinton, the top five ads were actually her charitable donations and things that she was doing. And if you went to any other search engine, like Bing, DuckDuckGo, any other search engine, you Google Donald Trump, well, the first five ads were still absolutely horrible ads. But the first five ads for Hillary were also still horrible ads like the scandals that she did. So here's the question. If, if, if you actually want to make a bipartisan decision on who to vote for, and you go to Google to do your research because you don't know what's going to go on, because you don't know enough about it, and you Google one person and they are like all this bad stuff, and you Google another person it's all the charitable stuff, well, who do you think you're going to want to shift towards? It depends where you're Googling from. Well, Google's, but that's, Google's crazy that way. So. That's why I'm like, if you go into AI and you're like, oh, um, is Joe Biden cohesive and sane? Then yeah, he's like great mental health and very good fitness and stairmaster and glory, right? So, and by the way, I'm not pro-Trump. I'm not saying that right now at all. I want to be very clear on this. I just want to show you the bias of what these companies do. That's why AI chat 
AI. But ChatGPT doesn't computer. talk about people, right? Because I think I've actually I tried to do some research. It sounds weird, but it was like on my mom and I, and I've in the past, and it would it would be like yeah no we don't we don't really talk about. It. So I haven't tested and measured this myself yet, yeah. but from what I understand, if you were like um, write in like uh, write a paragraph as Robin Williams, it would actually if you read it, it would be like Robin Williams. Um, or write like a description of, of him, right? right. Have this description. From what I understand, and I haven't tested and measured this yet, it would be a very easy one to test and measure, but someone did that with Jordan Peterson, and it said something along the lines of right, like far right wing activist and all the rest. And I'm not saying he's, he's clearly on the right versus left if you really want to make that comparison, but he is not like far right crazy sides of it. So that that's where it, um, I'm going to get myself in such hot water here, I feel. But that's where I kind of, um, I don't agree when, when we only get one side. Like, yeah, yeah. What, like I have my political beliefs, but I follow all sides. Like, I follow Pierre Polivare, I follow Justin Trudeau, I follow Jagmeet Singh, because I, I want to be able to educate it to see what it is. I don't want to be in my own echo chamber. And those chat programs and Google, and even algorithms and Facebook, is, is just a giant echo chamber. Yeah. Um, and it's scary as crap, so. But, hey, it makes me money, because I get to do a lot of Facebook ads and sell yeah. houses, so why not? Yeah. yeah. I just sent you a chat GPT right. seminar. Right. Thank, this you. Video Thank you. You're very welcome.